Judges of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. We are here today in the matter of Gluba Aldrich and Battaglia versus State Objections Panel and Intervenors. And it looks like all of the parties are ready. It's my understanding there's going to be a division of time. I've been given the, number, the minutes per person, but you guys are in charge of that. We'll pay attention to the full 30 minutes. You pay attention to division. And, um, and we'll begin with, I believe, Mr. Hurd is going first for the appellants. May it please the court, justices, Chief Justice Christensen. Justice May, you said it best in 2018 on, on ruling an objection to a petition for Governor Ron Corbett's nomination, when you said unequivocally that Chapter 43 governs primary elections. When you read Chapter 43 in its entirety, it becomes clear that Iowa Code Section 4324 only applies to primary elections. It can only be used to challenge someone on the primary ballot. First, let's look at the title of Chapter 43. The title is Partisan Nominations, Primary Elections. Second, Iowa Code Section 4367 states that the winner of a primary election is entitled to have that candidate's name printed on the general election ballot without further certificate. Likewise, chapter, Iowa Code Chapter or Section 4388 states that a person nominated by convention by a political party shall be treated as if they had won the primary and shall have their name on the ballot as if they won the primary. And that is again without further certificate. Fourth, the Iowa Code section 4324 uh, relates to the certification of the names to appear on the primary ballot. That code section explicitly mentions 4324 as a reason for delay in the certification of those names on the primary ballot. If the General Assembly wanted to authorize Iowa Code Section 4324 to, to be used to challenge someone's name on the general election ballot, they would have stated so. They would have explicitly stated that is an option versus leaving it exclusively to the primary ballot. Fifth, I. Let's start with the language of the statute, uh, 4324 1A. It says objections to the legal sufficiency of a nomination petition or certificate of nomination filed or issued under this chapter. Isn't that what uh, these three candidates did? They filed certificates of nomination under this chapter go beyond the plain language of the statute? Uh, I would argue, uh, thank you for the question. I would argue that they did not issue certi- <laughs> I would argue that they did not issue- For my questions. <laughs> you, you'll get them either way. Um, I will argue that they did not issue cer or file certificates under the chapter. They were nominated by convention. The certificate that is mentioned in Iowa Code Section 4388 is one that can't be challenged under 4324 because it, they are treated as if they had won the primary and that they are entitled to their name on the ballot without further certificate. Certificate of nomination that's being, that can be challenged under 4324. Certificate of nomination that can be challenged would be the one that is filed under Iowa Code Section 4314, which includes the petition for not candidacy and the affidavit of candidacy. Um, that is the one that entitles or puts their name on the primary ballot. Um, and if you look further down in Iowa Code Section 4324, um, it explicitly mentions certificate of nominations in the instance uh, where a party's primary candidate has died prior to the primary. So if that happens, that was going to be one of my questions. So if you have a primary and your candidate dies, and then you can have a convention, right? And then there's a certificate of nomination under 4388, right? Certificate of nomination under 4323. Uh, that explicitly provides for a certificate of nomination by the party there. Okay, um, Mike, I want to go back to what you said about 4314. I don't think it uses the term certificate. Isn't 4314 referring to, isn't that the nomination petitions? 
nominating petition, yes, and they also receive a certificate of nomination for the ballot, um, on the primary ballot under 4322. Um, that is the certification um, of nomination. Okay, yeah, let me push back on that though. I, I kind of thought that as I read through the chapter, but when you look at it, that's a little bit internally inconsistent because 4322 also is the one where it says if there's no, or as soon as practicable, if an objection is pending under 4324. So that seems a little bit internally inconsistent to me. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with that, Justice. Um, mm -hmm. The certificate of nomination is a term of art that is used within very few sections of chapter 43. It is utilized in uh, 4324, it is also used in 43115, and that is for primary elections for city elections. It is the certificate of nomination as a term of art is not explicitly mentioned in 4388 for the nomination by convention. of nomination is different than a certificate of nomination. Um, and that is, there's a couple reasons for that. One, um, the language in 4376 or 67 says that they are entitled to their name on the ballot without further certificate. So they have their original certificate of nomination for the primary ballot, and then if they win the primary, they are entitled to their name on the general election ballot without further certificate. That tells me that the Iowa General Assembly did not want challenges to someone who had won the primary, because there's no certificate at that point to challenge under 4324. Um, and then back to your question, Justice Mansfield, the another reason why the plain language, as it's been interpreted thus far in 4324, um, should not be allowed to challenge, to allow objectors to challenge someone on the general election ballot, is the difference in the wording used for objections on partisan nominations under 43 and nonpartisan nominations under chapter 44 and chapter 45. What statutory provision would apply and how would you adjudicate a dispute where following a state convention two candidates filed these certificates for the same congressional seat. That is, I would argue that the challenge at that point would come to the judicial branch. Um, they would be the ones who could adjudicate the dueling uh, certificates presented after a convention. Um, the Secretary of State and the objection panel has no statutory authority to determine what happened at a state convention? Um, no, they would definitely have authority, Justice. Um, provision that applies if you think this only applies to primaries. The statute that would apply in that circumstance would be, uh, I believe it would be tw uh, 34 or 4388, which requires that the chair and the uh, secretary of the convention certify to the Secretary of State or the state commissioner who was nominated at convention. Um, in that instance, um, it, I believe that would allow the Secretary of State to do an investigation and determine which certification w is the true one because they have to certify uh, under oath, I believe, to the Secretary of State that that is the person nominated. And even if uh, an objection would be allowed under 43-24 for a situation like that, it would be the people of the Libertarian Party or whatever party nominated those two individuals or one individual, even though another is claiming, to rectify that. They are the ones that were at the convention. They're the ones that are members of the party. They are the ones that can determine which candidate was the one actually nominated by the party. Cases of intra-party disputes. So it seems like the most common fact pattern from the case law is you have two competing conventions claiming to both be the legal representatives of a party and they file competing nomination or certification papers. At least that's the most common fact pattern I've seen. So what statute addresses that fact pattern? The statute that addresses that fact pattern uh, would be the, uh, the caucus section and also the county conventions where you have a process that delineates going from the caucuses to the county to the state or district convention. Um, it would, there should be a record of who was nominated at, or who, which delegates were selected at the caucus, and then after that, 
county convention and selects delegates, and there should be a record of that to, uh, to the state convention. And it should, there should be a trail. Uh, Here? I mean, the objection is there isn't a trail. The, the objectors here are not members of the Libertarian Party, and I don't, there were no dueling certificates in this um, scenario. There, uh, there was no certificate other than the nominate, certification of the nomination by the convention, uh, which is certified by the chair and the secretary. Um, the language, the differences in languages between the objections under 44 and 45 for nonpartisan versus the objections under 43 for partisan nominations, I think is very key to why 4324 can only be used for primaries. In uh, chapter 45, which is nominations by petitions, those um, follow the same objection standard that's in 44 for non-political organization objections. And in that statute, 44.4, it states that the, a person can file an objection uh, as long as they are able to vote for a candidate for the office in question. His argument that it's not this chapter uh, or section 4324 is not just for primaries. That language you just stated for the office in question, um, enlighten me, which office are we talking about? If, if it's what I think it is, wouldn't these uh, objectors be qualified to file an objection? Yes, so the office we're talking about is for the um, Congress, for a congressional seat. And the language I just quoted was... Eligible voter in the state of Iowa gets to vote on that, right, if they're in that precinct. Disagree with that, Justice. Um, the language um, I just stated where they have the ability to vote for a candidate for the office in question, that is in 44.4 for non-political organizations. There is a one word difference between that language and what is found in 4324. Candidate instead of a candidate? We're gonna split those hairs and that, that decides who gets to vote for a congressman or congresswoman in this state? In the primary election, yes, Justice. Well, I said I assume this is not just about primaries. 24 is not just applicable to primaries, as you're arguing. Yes, then um, anyone in the state of Iowa within their district would have the ability to vote for them. Yes, Your Honor. You have that argument, 43.24, to apply only to primaries in order for your argument to be successful. Is that correct? That they're not qualified objectors? Yes, for that specific argument, yes. Um, and that is complemented by uh, Iowa Code Section 4338 which is within chapter 43, which limits the voting on the primary ballot to only members of the party and those who affiliate with the party. Um, I believe that some factual issues for me from the record. Um, I'm not sure that all of the exhibits from the objections panel maybe are in the record. So you have the caucuses, right? The party does. And then on the same night, the county conventions are also held. And at the county convention, what occurred there from this record? County convention, uh, delegates were uh, under the chapter 43, they had the business of electing candidates or selecting uh, delegates to go to the state convention and district convention um, and then any party platform business. Um, but the main, the main task of the county convention is to select delegates for the state and district convention was a convention that was held on June 8th, is that right? And district convention. A state and district convention at the same time. All right, let me back that up. It was a district convention for the nominations of these three candidates for the Libertarian Party. Are the minutes of those conventions or the caucuses in our record? It kind of, I thought that there was a subpoena that was at least at the panel level, that they were supposed to have presented those documents, and I'm not sure if they were, but I haven't seen them. May I defer to another uh, representative here for the three candidates, who is the chair of the party, that would know the answer much better than I. To clarify, on June 8th, there were three separate convent, from this record, there were three separate conventions held in three different locations? No, Justice, there were two conventions, just the district convention and state convention on June 8th. The county convention was back in January after the caucuses. Okay. Sorry, on that point, after the, the caucuses, is there some delineation where the caucus happens, caucus ends at a certain 8 p.m., 
and then the county convention starts at 810 or 815 or what's the record show on that? Yeah, uh, record uh, shows that there's an adjournment of the caucus and then a calling of the county convention based on the delegates that were elected at that caucus. Um, that re those records were provided to uh, the Secretary of State or the objection panel. Um, and I, if they did not get into the record, I will make sure those get on filed in the record as soon as I can. Well, for the, at the state convention and maybe even at the county conventions, there's no contention here that any of the people elected as delegates to the convention and then from the county to the state, that was all done in one night. I mean, everybody's kind of in the same boat from a factual perspective. There is no outlier county that had its county convention after midnight on the following day. Everybody factually is in the same position. Is that right? Okay. And so anybody who participated at the state convention would have been sent as a delegate from those county delegates voting. Okay. A general question. Um, uh, I need to get closer to the mic. The chief reminds me. Um, if uh, any of the, uh, the three candidates who are um, appealing, if any of them had gone out and gathered signatures in the same manner that let's say the Democratic candidates that are on the general election ballot had done, they would be on the ballot, right? Okay, so this is, what we're talking about is kind of what is in Iowa a fallback, a way a candidate can get on the ballot if they don't go and gather the, the signatures f to, uh, for a primary uh, candidacy, is that correct? And the nomination by convention, I would argue, is just as strong or as valid as someone who is on the primary through the petition process. Um, and that is through the operation of 4388, where it says that they shall be treated as if they had won the primary. Because you, you have to make a nomination through a primary under Abaco Chapter 43. Um, and that's why convention nominations are treated as if they had won the primary. Um, the agree that, that it's just as strong, has just as much um, punch. But isn't that assuming that procedurally the rules were followed? Under 4388, I believe the only requirements that are necessary for a nomination is the certification from the secretary and chair of the convention to the state commissioner, the secretary of state, that the nomination was made. Everything else that's in 4324, assuming that it's not just for primaries? No justice, they cannot bypass that, but the remedy for non-compliance, uh, technical non-compliance with that, is not to remove their nominations from the ballot. It is more of the, it's the sanctions process or specific performance and may, requiring them to get into compliance. The performance apply here? Um, so the, one of the, the initial objection by the objectors was that the county convention delegates were not reported uh, to the county. That is something that could be remedied by just recording those with the... A point I wanted to ask you about. Um, the district court didn't address that issue, um, but if we were to agree with you, don't we need to address some of those other procedural issues that the objectors brought up um, and the fact that, um, that those were not complied with as well? The district court um, stated or ruled that the objectors waived the reporting requirements to the county officials. Um, but those, com those requirements for um, holding the county convention a day later and record reporting those delegates to the county is for the purpose of party business. It's for the party to know who the delegates are and for the, I guess, general public as well to know that there are delegates for this party and therefore those people are the valid individuals at the convention. Making a substantial compliance argument right now. And wouldn't that be a better argument after election? and strict before? Uh, no, Justice. It is an argument that has to be made now because the, our candidates are off the ballot. There will not be a general election where our candidates could be elected um, other than a write-in campaign. Um, if our candidates are removed from the ballot, their 
substantial compliance is no longer on the table unless they had won the election. If I, if I understand your question correctly. I don't think it's as obtrusive to um, require strict compliance before an election, get your ducks in a row. Once election has occurred and Iowa's voters have gone out and deadlines have passed, maybe that's a better, safer space to argue substantial compliance? I would agree with that, Justice. Um, but I, the purpose of the nominating process is to make sure that candidates have a certain minimum level of support. And that is within the party, if they are a political party, under Iowa Code Section 43.2, which requires their previous election to either the president or gubernatorial candidate to get 2% uh, or more of the vote. Once that threshold is met, they're a political party. Um, there, thereafter, it is the party, they, they have a minimum level of support at that point, and then the party, it gets to decide who their nominee is. A lot of those procedural matters um, are for the party purposes of making sure that the party um, knows who the delegates are from the convention to the state convention, and then who their district uh, convention delegates are. The if the if everyone in the party agrees that we're just going to ignore all the requirements in the statute, then no one can challenge that. Is that your position? You can't ignore those statutes. They're they're there for a reason. The General Assembly intended for them to be complied with. The but the people who have the ability to object to a nomination would be the people within the Libertarian Party. Those are the people that have the standing or the interest in making sure that those procedures were followed. There's no real interest on someone outside of the party in making sure that the party followed the process to ensure that that party nominated that candidate, in fact. The, and I see my time has passed, so I will let my co-counsel go. Ms. DeCook. May it please the court, Chief Justice Christensen, justices. My name is Jen DeCook, and I am an attorney with Coppola Hockenberg PC here in Polk County. I represent the petitioner, Marco Battaglia, who is the duly nominated Libertarian Party candidate for United States Congress, 3rd Congressional District in the state of Iowa. And the fundamental question before this court is, does a failure to wait 181 minutes after caucus to begin convention justify kicking libertarian candidates off the ballot and violating Iowa voters' constitutional rights to political opportunity? We believe that petitioners and precedents say no. The risk to our elections from allowing this level of interference by a panel without authority to adjudicate it is too great and will lead to the exact result that the state claims to want to present, which prevent, which is destabilizing our elections. Um, I'd like to jump into some of the questions that Mr. Hurd had addressed. Um, we do not believe that strict compliance is appropriate here because we're talking about fundamental rights. So strict compliance with what is inherently an administrative statute is an improper standard to apply for denial of fundamental constitutional rights. Was this argument waived because, in, because it wasn't raised with the panel? Well, Judge, I would argue that if there had been facts not, pre Justice, I would argue that if there had been facts not presented to the panel, that those would have been waived. However, voting as a fundamental right, I don't believe is a legal argument that can be waived. And strict compliance, candidly, did not come into play until we had our ruling from the district court that said it was going to mandate strict compliance with the rulings from, uh, on its ruling on compliance with this particular Certainly. Um, so what I would say, Judge, is when you have a, Justice, when you have a fundamental right with the qual constitutional quali qualifications of an electorate issue, our biggest issue here is, did we argue that voting is a fundamental right? Now, I will admit that I was not um, on the panel that argued before, or I was not one of the people who argued before the panel, but I do believe that voting as a fundamental right was in fact argued before the panel, and it was certainly argued in front of the district court. Absolutely a fundamental right. It's also a fundamental right for all the people of Iowa. I'm just imagining you know, my young kids, when they first got the right to vote, 
looking at that ballot and you trust that the people on that ballot have been put there appropriately. And, and so the legislature has also, I think, a really strong valid interest in making sure Chapter 43 protects the voters of Iowa. So can't that argument go both ways? Justice, what I would say is we have an opportunity here to look at the statute from a procedural lens and not a constitutional lens. And as you all know, just five months ago, you decided that there, if there was an opportunity to avoid constitutional issues, this court was going to take it. And what we have here is Iowa voting law is codified between um, section or chapter 39 and chapter 55. And sorry. Serious constitutional issue, honestly. Um, there's a fundamental right to vote. There's, that's the ultimate right. And states can manage that right in various ways, including by requiring candidates to demonstrate levels of support in order to get on the general election ballot. And um, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, they've told us, the state could require only primaries. Um, and none of these candidates went through the steps that would have triggered a primary, which is the preferred method under, under Iowa law. Um, so what am I missing? Field, I would uh, direct you to Iowa Code 39A.1, which is where the General Assembly specifically recognizes, and I'm quoting from the statute, instances may arise in which technical infractions of chapters 39 through 53 may occur, which do not merit any level of criminal sanction. In such instances, administrative notice from the state or county commissioner of elections is sufficient. And I would also like to point out that objectors additionally could have sought an injunction to force the county to hold a convention if they felt that processes had not been properly followed. I'd like to direct the justice's attention to the timeline here. We know that as of June 5th, uh, Mr. Ostergren, who represents the objectors, had reached out to county convention or county auditors to find out about um, procedural questions with certifying uh, elector or certifying delegates. June 14th was the deadline to hold a county convention. So the Libertarians could have cured had Ostergren objected on that date, but he did not. He chose to hold his powder. And so that's why this is obstructionism and voter suppression. On the 5th, Mr. Ostergren, the objectors knew that there were problems procedurally with the way that the caucus and the conventions had been held. At that, oh problems and attempt to fix it? I don't, that is not something that I believe they did know at that time. It's my understanding. Mr. Grin responsible for knowing there were problems um, with your client? Well, I think that when we're making arguments about the state interest and fundamental rights that everyone has an obligation if they have knowledge to share that knowledge. There's inquiries being made to the state auditor's office and there's an opportunity in 39A.1 to notify the state or county commissioner of elections and they could have provided sanctions and at that point the libertarians could have cured. I'm not saying that the libertarians... Okay. Two percent threshold in the last election. They still had to elect... That's my understanding, yes, Justice McDonald. So what obligation do they have to retain legal counsel or say it, the party, what obligation does it have to get legal advice to make sure that it's complying with election law? It seems like your position is, is that other attorneys around the state should be advising the Libertarian Party about how they should comply with election law when they're aware of violations. I mean, doesn't the party have an obligation to know the law as well? But I'm not arguing that there should be some kind of protectionism over any party. What I'm saying is. I apologize. Under 39A.1, I believe he had a duty to notify the state or county commissioner of elections at that point if he was going to object. The issue that we have here is that procedurally, the state objections panel does not have the authority to hear these claims. The authority is vested. Mr. Ostergren's objection was filed timely. You just think it should have been earlier? I think that the objection that he made was improper because it should not have been made to the panel. Timing. Do you think the timing 
was appropriate, even though you wished it had been earlier? I think that the, under the statute, he was in compliance with the timing, yes. Paul, zealous representation, why should he tip you off any sooner than necessary? Because we have fundamental rights at issue, and I think that that's the most important thing that we're dealing with here. Ask you um, about the 181 minutes that are really at issue here. Was there any good excuse for the 181 minute delay? So under the bylaws of the Libertarian Party, as I understand them, Justice May, which I believe those are in the record, although the minutes unfortunately are not, and also to address that, the lists of the delegates are also in the record, everyone who attended. So under the Libertarian Party bylaws, they were in compliance with their bylaws. And so that was what they governed their procedure with. Now, certainly. I, that raises an interesting question because I think in your bylaws, um, there are certain committee members take effect. Um, they go, their term starts immediately on adjourning of the meeting, which is different than what the statute is for delegates. Um, can you address that difference? I mean, I think that what we're dealing with, again, is what's the harm to the voters? What's the harm to the state? We want orderly objections, certainly. We have a panel that's very clearly authorized to look at the four corners of the petition. Legal sufficiency here is the same as legal sufficiency in litigation. We're not looking at facts outside the petition. The contents of the petition, the contents of the um, the contents of the documents that the panel is authorized to review are very clearly laid out. And legal sufficiency should not be expanded to include process. That's not something that a candidate has control over. The candidate can make sure that they can do everything they can to ensure that their nominating petition and their certificate of nomination are complete. But to put the burden on a candidate to make sure the process by which delegates are nominated is the candidate's responsibility. I don't believe that that's within the purview of, of 43.24, and I certainly don't believe it's in the, in the statutory intention, the legislative intention, given the amendments that we've seen to 43.24, narrowing it, which justices you addressed in Schmidt. I see I have gone over my time. I apologize. Were there any other questions? There were a couple people talking on top of each other. Okay, you may be seated. We will now move to the appellees, and it's my understanding Mr. Admonson will go first. May it please the court. Uh, good morning, your honors. My name is Will Admonson on behalf of the state objection panel. Um, I'd like to start by just zooming out and talking about the statutory framework that sets up the state objections panel. So the legislature could have chosen to have the secretary of state be the one person that rules on compliance with election laws, and that elections are. That, that could have been the framework. But that's not the framework that the legislature chose. Instead, chapter 4324, subsection 1, at the very start, says that nomination petitions or certificates of nomination filed under this chapter, which are apparently in conformity with the law, are valid unless an objection is made in writing. If an objection is made in writing, it doesn't go to the Secretary of State, to the elections are, to have one person deciding on these challenges. It goes to a panel um, of multiple political members, and they're the ones that rule on the objection. And what the panel is ruling on, they're not kicking people off the ballot. What they're doing is they're deciding whether or not the, the hoops that candidates have to jump through, whether the paperwork that they have to file is legally sufficient in order to get them on the ballot in the first place. Um, so you're calling them hoops, and I agree. I mean, it does, three hours does seem kind of ticky tack. Help me understand, are we looking at substantial compliance or strict compliance? No, Your Honor, we're, we're not looking at substantial compliance. And um, the reason for that is, is the text of chapter 43. So the legislature expresses um, substantial compliance in writing, and then it also expresses it in, in um, the lack of substantial compliance when it, it leaves it out of the statute. So there are, are several sections in Chapter 43 that, that appear to allow for substantial compliance, subsections 10, 14.1, and 88.3. They all use the language in substantially the form. Please restate those three subsections. Subsection 10, 14, 1, 
and 88, point, uh, 88 subsection 3. And, and the last one, um, 4388, we, we were talking about that earlier. That's specifically the certificate of nomination statute, um, but it's subsection 3, which is talking about an affidavit of candidacy. Section refers to a certification of nomination. Make it different from a certificate of nomination. I would say no, Your Honor. Um, so starting with the text of Chapter um, 4324, it says objections to the legal sufficiency of a certificate of nomination. Now, the specific phrase certificate of nomination is not defined in the chapter. Peer very often other than in 4324. Tell me what all the types of certificates of nomination there are contemplated. Well, the first one is in um, 4322, and that talks about the Secretary of State essentially certifying the group of people that have filed their nomination papers. Um, then there are several nominations uh, where the Secretary of State will certify who won the primary um, election. That's in 4373. Um, and then um, there's one by the Board of, of Canvassers as well. Um, that's in subsection 68. And I think up to this point, it's important to note that these are certificates that are issued by a governmental entity. Um, and they're just saying this is, you know. Challenged under 4324, all of those. Um, but in 4388, I know the title says certification of nominations. But the text says certificate. So it sounds to me like maybe they're one and the same. Exactly, Your Honor. And that was the point I was getting to. It's titled certification of nomination. No, that is not the, the literal phrase certificate of nomination. But if you look to the text, it, it refers to such certificate. And so here you have a statute that's clearly talking about a certification that a political party has to make. And, and the statute is specifically referring to such certificate. And if, if you look back to, to 4324, it says any certificate of nomination issued or filed under this chapter. Now, the legislature knows how to cross-reference certain certificate of nominations if it wanted to narrow down that universe. It didn't. It said under this chapter. It also said filed or issued. Now, that, that distinction is important because, remember, a minute ago I was talking about how certain certificates of nomination um, are issued by the Secretary of State or governmental bodies. Those would be issued. But the certificate of nomination that's filed would be the one by the party in 4388-1. Can we talk a little bit about the de facto authority doctrine? So... I think the general rule is we don't allow third parties to collaterally attack um, actions by officials or quasi-officials if they have some claim or colorable claim to title to the position. So in this case, you have people who were elected delegates at the precinct caucus, correct? Yes. And if they would have waited 188 minutes, they could have voted for delegates for the county convention, correct? That would have a convention if they waited, yes, sir. Uh, but they acted three hours too soon. Why should we care if there's no contest as to who the actual delegates are and there's no contest that they would have had legal authority to exercise uh, to vote for delegates if they had waited a sufficient amount of time it seems like the case law is pretty clear that we're not going to allow these kinds of collateral challenges. So why wouldn't that apply here? I would say for the same reason that if a senator is elected, a Senate is elected, and 181 minutes before that Senate's term start, they start passing laws and, and confirming judges. Um, we, we should care that they took an action without authority because it's a building block of democracy to have this funneling process where you have the de facto authority doctrine applies if you could have raised an objection at an earlier date and you didn't. And so things go on and, they are, and there's no objection. You know, for example, you know, those challenges like to federal administrative agencies, if somebody is challenging an action that the administrative agency is taking against them right now, 
they can raise the lack of authority of those individuals that comprise the, the agency. But if the agency did something in the past that wasn't challenged at the time, you can't go back in the past. It strikes me that here, here, your, your, the challenge was raised as soon as it could have been, which was when these particular candidates were filed their certificates of uh, nomination. Right, Your Honor, I agree. And, and I'm happy to met, let Mr. Ostergren um, talk a little bit more about the timing of, of when the objection was made and um, you know, that the state convention um, was held, purportedly held in, in June. Um, all I'll say is that um, another important provision of 4324 is the This issue, though, uh, if the point of this is to determine who has the legal authority to continue voting through the party process and ultimately nominate somebody, at the point at that, that authority has been exercised and then it's subsequently ratified at the state convention by party officials, and I don't think we don't have the minutes, so I guess I, we don't know what happened. Why should we care if the organization that's selecting its nominees um, and the people are acting under color of title, why should third parties be allowed to intervene in that process? So I, I have um, three points in response to your question, Your Honor. The first is, is the practical point that I made earlier. I, I won't repeat that. It's important that election laws have certain timing requirements, that those timing requirements are followed strictly because we're aggregating the precedents, uh, the, the preferences of millions of Iowans across the state up, and we need to ensure that at every level um, the party has authority. Now, I, uh, my second point is that I would um, uh, frame the, the question of authority a little bit differently. I don't think it's the, the, the question, the ultimate question in this case is whether the um, purported uh, state convention had authority. It's, it's the, at the end of the day, the question is, did the Libertarian Party of Iowa, did these candidates submit a, a certificate of nomination that is legally sufficient? So it's, it, it's not, oh, well, they had authority at one point, and so we don't, we don't really care in the future. It, not legally sufficient because the convention didn't have authority and the convention didn't have authority because the people who voted at the county caucus voted 188 minutes too soon. So party delegates ratified the prior action. Isn't this an authority question and that they subsequently have approved the prior actions? So I, I don't see how ratification could be relevant here, respectfully, Your Honor, because um, it's a, I'll go back to the analogy, it's funneling, right? Um, you have a precinct caucus. Yes, delegates were validly elected, but the individuals that met at the county caucus didn't represent the precinct caucus because they weren't delegates. Um, who were the delegates at that time? Say at 9 p.m., who were the, the uh, county convention delegates? I don't know their names off the top of your head, Your Honor. They were um, individuals at the, the precinct caucuses that were elected to go to the county convention. I think your argument is they didn't become delegates until midnight, right? So at nine o'clock, who were the delegates? Were there any? So the, there were none because the, the Libertarian Party of Iowa was not, um, did not choose to opt into this major party framework um, in, until just recently. So, so there were no kind of incoming delegates. Um, so they, they basically the Libertarian Party did not have delegates until midnight because no delegates term started until uh, midnight the day after the precinct caucus. Um, I, I'd like to go back to my third point in response to your question, um, wh which is that, that at the end of the day, this is a statutory interpretation case, and, and we're, we're dealing with um, the framework that the legislature set up for how we deal with these, these tricky, these, these contentious issues of complying with election framework. And the legislature wanted it to be neutral. They didn't want the one election czar being the one ruling on it. And so the, the legislature allows a, a broad swath of people 
to bring objections to the legal sufficiency of a certificate of nomination. And, and here, that objection couldn't have been brought until the certificate of nomination was issued. A similar but kind of related um, viewpoint. Why is a remedy for the fact that they held the, uh, the, conven the county convention three hours early um, nullification of everything that happened. You say in your brief that um, the purpose of 4394 is really protecting intra-party conflicts. And so maybe if there had been two certificates that had been presented, then okay, we go look at 4394 and we see who was the right delegate. But absent that, why is the remedy nullification of everything that happened at that county convention? So I... I guess I just I go back to the framework for for how this issue arises, which is the party has to submit paperwork, and if they don't submit the correct paperwork, then they they haven't met the requirements to be on the ballot. And so, um, yes, it's it's a matter of they didn't hold the proper convention, and so the result is that is their their paperwork, and they didn't meet Iowa's election law requirement to be on the ballot. So the Clarify. So when you're saying the paperwork, it's it's the certificate of nomination that they presented was not proper because the delegates that identified those candidates were not didn't have authority at the time that they did it. I apologize for using um, a little bit imprecise terminology. It's they have to have a certificate of nomination that is legally sufficient, and they have to submit that to um, the Secretary of State, and their certificate of nomination was not legally sufficient. Other than the, the substantial compliance um, kind of specifications that, that you talked about with the chief earlier, are there any other provisions in Chapter 43 for which strict compliance is not mandatory? In other words, they have to follow every other requirement in that chapter to AT or else a valid objection occurs? Um, there is one other. Um, it, it doesn't use the substantial compliance language. It, it's not relevant to this case, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. So um, to answer Your Honor's question, I, I don't want to say no, there's no other provision. I, I do believe there's one. It, it, it's not relevant here. Um, but beyond that, the, the legislature um, consistently uses either shall or may throughout chapter 43. And, and there's certainly some, some optional things that parties can. I'm looking at 4315 requires a nomination that nomination petition sheets, quote, shall be neatly arranged and securely fastened together before filing. So if a party submits nomination papers that are neatly arranged but not stapled, is that something where substantial compliance doesn't apply? We have to kick them off the ballot because they didn't have a staple? Um, so I, I, would, I would want to do a closer analysis about whether the substantial compliance provision in 4314 would apply to that because that's part of the nomination paperwork. Um, but assuming that that doesn't apply, because it does... Um, use the word shall, and um, Iowa Code 4.130 subsection A says that the word shall, unless otherwise specified, does create a duty that would be a mandatory requirement. However, there's a second sentence to, to 4324, which, as this court held in the Schmidt case, limits the grounds specifically for nomination petitions and the signatures that are required. It has to be Take section 43.95, which discusses the county convention, and it says that the convention shall be called to order by the chairperson of the county central committee. Let's say that the chairperson has to leave to take a phone call. Someone else calls that meeting to, to order. Is that a valid objection warranting kicking someone off a ballot because the wrong person called that meeting to order? Um, well, well, the first thing I would do is I would run it through um, whether that's one of the grounds in 4324. Um, it doesn't seem to go to the eligibility um, of a candidate um, because that's, that's the, the, one of the questions that this court answered in the, the Chido case, um, whether they've committed a crime or something like that. So it doesn't seem to go to that one. Um, calling the commission order, that 
that doesn't seem to go to the nomination paperwork, right? The, the, it's not a paperwork issue. So the only potential one would be the legal sufficiency of a certificate of nomination. Um, I think that's probably a closer question. Um, standing up here today, just my gut instinct, Your Honor, would, would be that it, it probably wouldn't affect the legal sufficiency um, unless there was some very, very specific way that a state convention. Um, so 181 minutes does? That's, that's the big deal that we're here about, 181 minutes? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, 4394 creates a, a strict condition that for this big funneling process, this statewide funneling process where we're having millions of voters' preferences um, narrowed down by, by electing a representative and then gathering together and electing a representative, this, this massive framework has to have certain timing requirements. And even if you're close to those timing requirements, it's important to comply strictly with them so elections can run orderly and transparently and fairly. So, so to answer your question, yes. Um, the Libertarian Party was close, 181 minutes, um, but there's no provision in 4394 that allows for substantial compliance, unlike other parts of the code. The answer would be the same if the time gap was any different. I mean, if we were talking about one minute, would it be the same? Would that be a reasonable interpretation of the statute? Your Honor, um, one minute would, would not be enough. It, it would not comply with the statute. As Chief Judge Huppert reasoned that the word shall creates a mandatory condition. And I, and I think he's exactly right there. Um, Iowa Code 4.130A says that the word shall creates a duty. And the legislature allowed for substantial compliance in other areas that it thought, you know what, if you don't get the date right on the you know, if, if a signature is missing a date or if the date's a little bit incorrect, you forget what the day is, that's fine. That's in the bucket of we'll let that, you know, be substantial compliance, but not with timing. Again, this is a, a big framework for funneling down preferences. Um, and, and, and to further answer your question, Your Honor, I think it, it's, it's helpful to think about, well, what if it was the reverse? What if substantial compliance was allowed? Um, okay. One minute, maybe that might be substantial compliance. Um, two minutes, that's probably substantial compliance. Three, four, I mean, it's hard to draw the line for substantial compliance, and that's, that's not really a workable principle in practice when you're talking about timing. Um, and, and I'll just circle back to a newly elected Senate that passes laws that confirms judges just a couple minutes before their term starts. Um, this is the same character little different because with the, the Senate, you have old senators and then new ones. Here, we don't have any other delegates. There's only one delegate once they are elected at that precinct caucus. So there's no question about who has authority to act at that point, at least as, as between these delegates and other delegates. And, and I understand that, that factually for this case, um, the circumstances might be different because this is a new party that's taking on the burdens of the major party framework. Um, but I think that, the, that this court should look to the purpose of the law, writing it um, kind of behind the veil of ignorance, right? If, if you're writing a law for delegate terms, do you think about new parties? It, it, it's important to think about the law. There would be no, no delegates during that period because once the new ones are elected at caucus, the old one's term starts. And, and that goes to why it's important to have a gap between the precinct caucus and the, the county convention. So it's, it's not just um, that the state has other purposes other than just staggering these, these conventions. Uh, the fact that county conventions and precinct caucuses are staggered goes to more state interest. For instance, um, it makes it harder for a smaller group to, to take over the party because they would have to meet in the dead of night. That, that makes um, small party takeover much more difficult. Um, it promotes both internal and external transparency. There are um, lots of reporting requirements, both that a party has to report internally into the party and then externally um, to, to the state auditor who the delegates are elected. Um, and that builds in time for challenges. If, if we have disputes about what goes on in a, 12.05 and it would have been okay, when, when would there have been time for a dispute there? Um, Sorry. The answer to your question is, is yes. If the 
party held a county convention during, on the day where the delegates' terms had started, then yes, that, that would be a, a valid county convention. Um, and I think that, that to zoom out, it, it's important to look at the application of these laws kind of behind a veil of ignorance. Why would the, the legislature choose to have delegates' terms start on the next day in order to break up the county convention and the precinct caucuses? It encourages reporting. It encourages, it, it makes sure that, that parties have to have a, a modicum of support and if they're taking on the, the immense benefit of being a major party in the state, that they have the organizational structure and the supporters to have two different meetings. Could have ended the precinct caucus at 11.55 and started the county convention at midnight. There's no actual time built in here. Is there? I mean, the, the, the statute doesn't build some particular number of hours. It could be a matter of seconds. And I take your honor's point that the way that the delegates' terms are structured absolutely could be structured to make it even more difficult for, um, for parties to hold quick meetings in, in successions. I, I think that just the fact that you ha would have to hold the meeting in the dead of night makes it just marginally more likely that there's going to be less fraud. And, and I mean, I think we're getting away from what the purpose of this provision is. And this provision is identifying when the delegate, which delegate has authority to act. It's really not talking about when the meetings are to be held. If that was the purpose, then they would have said not just the following day, there would be a timing requirement. This really doesn't go to the timing between the caucus and the convention. Doesn't it really just identify who is the delegate that has authority to act? Yes, Your Honor. This is, this is a, a provision that defines when a delegate's um, term starts. And to, to step back and take a 10,000 feet view, this is all part of the framework that aggregates the preferences of many, many voters um, throughout the state and, and has a rigid timetable schedule for when these happens. Um, Your Honor, I see that I'm, I'm into Mr. Ostergren's time, and, and so I think I'll, I'll see the podium um, to him. Uh, before I step away, I, I would like to thank the court and its staff and the clerks for um, considering this expedited case. I know it's an extreme amount of work on a short timetable, and the state objection panel is very thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. Justice McDonald, uh, had the candidates raised the de facto officer doctrine in any of the litigation below, which they haven't, so it's waived, I think the argument that I would have raised in response is, is that this is where the failure to provide public disclosure of who the delegates are comes into much more import. Because you can't claim to have this appearance of holding an office if you've done it secretly. And the transparency that it takes place when a party files its statutory obligation to file the records of the proceedings of the county convention with the county auditor to have public knowledge as to who actually represents this political party becomes that much more important. And so I would... Idle kind of argument that if none of these statutory procedures are complied with, there's not even kind of de facto authority? Is that, is that your argument? One of the arguments, I think also I would push back hard on the idea that the de facto officer doctrine would apply to a political party. I understand that to apply to people who exercise governmental authority, not of a private organization. So what duty does a candidate for office then have to diligence the authority of the people at a convention? So imagine if it were uh, a Republican or Democrat party convention um, and there were a large number of voters there. I mean, doesn't the candidate have some sort of uh, ability to rely on the fact that the people who are there at the convention are delegates without having a duty to go out and go to each auditor in each county and diligence kind of the bona fides of everybody voting? It has a responsibility if he or she wants access to the general election ballot, which is what Chapter 43, 44, and 45 are all about, to make sure that all of the procedural steps have been followed. The state has an obvious interest in regulating 
the process by which the general election ballot is formed. And if a candidate has, these candidates could have gotten 1,726 signatures, including 47 or more in half the counties in their district, and they'd be on the ballot this fall, no question. But they, they didn't do that, and so they want an alternative method to do it. And if, you know, if you're gonna- It's not just that they want it. Our code provides for an alternative version, right? Absolutely, but if they want that alternative method to not get the signatures to get on the primary ballot and have their party nominee selected through the primary process as the state has chosen is the default method for political parties, then you know, they're gonna hitch their wagon to a lame horse if they don't do some basic due diligence by making sure that the party has done what it is supposed to do making sure the party has done the things it voluntarily took on. You were exactly right to point out to council that it's not simply getting 2% of the vote in a presidential or gubernatorial election. The party then takes the next step saying, yes, we want this role as a political party, and they tell the Secretary of State that. And they undertook this obligation that comes with Chapter 43 of being a major party, and then didn't follow any of the rules to get there. Um, I will. Are there some other procedural issues other than um, the not filing the certificate of the or the identifying who the de delegates were? Well, the, the main thing that started this was the fact that none of these records had been filed, and so it looked to the public like no county conventions had had occurred. And then we filed the objections, and then the the. Libertarian Party files documents that they claim show that county conventions took place. That those documents actually only show one county convention with two people. There's no actually other. It might have been from your brief. Are the documents supporting that in the record? I don't think they are. And this is, we get a little bit into, is this a 17A judicial review or not? I, you know, we litigated it like it was, but the, the record has not been filed. And all I can say is, the appellants have not put those documents in the record for this court to be considered, and that's their obligation. And I, and I think if the, rec if the documents aren't there, there's no proof in the record that any county conventions actually occurred. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't nerd out a little bit on the discussion about the title of the code section versus you know, the verb form of the word certificate versus the noun form of the word certificate. Iowa Code Section 3.31, the title of a code section, the part in bold, all, this, all the head matter stuff, that's written by the code editor. It's not part of the law. It's not a valid basis for interpretation of what the statute means. The actual statutory language, the stuff that's not bolded, enacted by the legislature, consistently uses the term certificate of nomination. And that tracks directly with the language in 4324 about the authority of the state objections panel. Um, Thank you. Questions of Mr. Ostergren? Libertarian Party cites Winger versus Urban uh, in their brief. I, I want you to discuss that a little bit, um, its application, if any, to the facts of this case. So I think the, the, the requirement in the statute for strict compliance is from the word shall and is from the uh, legislature's uh, important policy purpose behind um, crafting the general election ballot in a regular way. And these rules, when, when, when the rule gets applied, it seems harsh. I get that. It, it, it seems harsh when you're a day late to file a lawsuit and it gets dismissed. It's, it seems harsh if you show up at the Secretary of State with 1,700 and 25 signatures, and you don't qualify for the ballot. Those rules seem harsh. But these rules and why strict compliance is necessary is they're like an insurance policy for the elections process. They're so that elections officials, when they have to make decisions on a quick timetable, know that there's regularity in the process. And if the court says, well, this is the kind of rule that we're just not gonna, you know, it's 181 minutes, you know, we're not gonna enforce that because gosh, it seems harsh. Well then, there's no logical stopping place for that. And, and you know, we went right to where I thought we would go. 
If the caucus ends at 1159 and the county convention starts at 1201, is that valid? Yes. If you file the lawsuit a minute before the statute of limitations, is it valid? Yes. If you file it a minute late, is it valid? No. And, you know, libertarians chose to be a political party. They shouldn't rely on me to tell them how to run their party affairs. And they have to follow these rules. And, and I, you know, we could go into hypotheticals of other rules in the process of stapling petitions. I can tell you, Justice McDermott, if you show up at the Secretary of State's office with a box full of loose leaf petition papers, they're not gonna take them. And it doesn't matter, I mean, later maybe you can prove you had all the signatures you had to in all the counties. You show up with a loose leaf box, just loose papers in a box, they won't take them. There has to be regularity in the process. And if you want to be on the general election ballot and have every eligible Iowan who can participate in that election show up and decide you among other people, you got to follow those rules. And, and, I, and I will wrap up with, there was, uh, I think, a very strong argument or strongly presented argument, but legally weak argument on the fundamental right to vote. This dispute is not about the fundamental right to vote. Every Iowan who wants to vote on November 5th gets to vote on November 5th. Every Iowan who wants to write in Marco Battaglia's name or Nicholas Gluba's name or Charles Aldrich's name can, can do that. And they can vote on all the races that they want to. This is about how do you as a candidate have access to the general election ballot. And the US Supreme Court has made abundantly clear um, it, the, the Monroe versus Socialist Party case we cited and many others that if you look at the Anderson verdict framework, which this court has adopted as well, that those rules about how you get on the ballot, neutral or non-discriminatory, the state has a valid enforceable interest in regulating the general election ballot and those rules matter. The, this is not, you don't have a fundamental right to be on the ballot whenever you want, no matter what things you haven't followed in the process. With that, we would ask the court to affirm the district court. Thank you. And I'm not sure which one, Ms. Hurd or Ms. DeCook? Ms. DeCook. Looks like it's Ms. DeCook. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. We've had an admission by the interveners that there was no injury in fact here. There's no delegate conflict, there's no ballot confusion. So there's been an admission here that the objectors today are asking for an advisory opinion. There's no injury, there's no threat to Iowa election law. We are talking about statutory interpretation, that's absolutely correct. If there's a problem with the staples, you get to cure. It's under 39A.6. One minute from the deadline and you bring in a box of loose papers. Justice, we don't. Yeah. Dr. Ostergren is correct that they're going to say no. Don't you think you'd have to comply within one minute? I think that the analogy to statute of limitations is, a, a, yeah. Hypothetical, do you think they would be given an extension of that one minute with a loose pa box of papers? So I think that if there were a one minute extension and there had been that kind of technical violation, it was, oh, sorry it would allow going beyond that one minute deadline. I think that if there were an objection filed under 39A.6, that could be properly adjudicated. I don't think that that's something that should be adjudicated by a non-elected panel or by someone who is the county auditor accepting those petitions at that time. I think that's a question for judicial review because I think there's questions of equity there and I think we also go back to our fundamental rights. And I wanted to address, oh, so your one situation, which I, I referred to it as the opposing counsel as being a ticky-tack situation, three hours, 181 minutes, however you want to frame it. Okay, you're, you're one entity that wants to do it. What if there's three or four other entities who also barely hit that 2%, but they're in? Now we have four or five groups with ticky-tack violations. Are we going to have all of those on our ballots in Iowa? I mean, what's to say about these rules? Why do we even have that chapter in place? Well, Justice, that's where I do believe that 39A comes in. I mean, when we have ticky-tack violations, there's a remedy for those violations. And it's very clearly outlined under 39A. If there needs to be uh, 
notice of technical violation and cure, there's a provision for that in the statute. We don't need to empower a panel that's not authorized by our legislature to do that kind of policing. We already have those statutes in place. You're, you gotta admit your clients took the tougher path. They absolutely took the tougher path. Whether that was on purpose or not, I guess we'll never know. They chose a more rigorous path. There are more um, hoops, I think was the word used, definitely. Um, is that asking too much? Doesn't that seem uh, fair for the voters of Iowa that, that there's a pretty rigid protocol to follow in order to get on that, that precious ballot that 18 year olds who are incredibly immature and brats, because I have five of them who've been there, but my point is, they're gonna be looking at that and every other Iowan is going to trust that those names that are on there, which have a simple little box right next to it, it looks so simple actually. Don't you think that Iowans deserve an opportunity to know that, that the process to get that name on there was followed? Absolutely, Justice. I just think it's not this process that the objectors chose. I mean, I think when we talk about fundamental rights arguments, we can talk about ticky-tack violations because the Libertarian Party was told that the objection was that they had not, in fact, held a convention. That was the notice that they properly received 72 hours before the hearing was held. But then when they presented evidence that a convention had actually occurred, which is in the record, there's the names of the... Um, uh, the names of the attendees and the delegates are in the record before the district court, and you'll also find the affidavit of Ben Held, which is, I believe, Exhibit 2. two. Or I saw the affidavit from Ben Held, but I haven't seen the names of the delegates. Do you know where they're at? It's my understanding that the names of the delegates to each county um, convention, and I'm, again, not... I wasn't there, so I'm, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn with the facts, and I might defer to Mr. Hurd on this, but it's my understanding that they were listed in Mr. Ostergren's exhibits, actually, the names of the people who actually attended, I believe. I think it's in uh, documents that are called objections. I'm not into, uh, we filed the objection to each petitioner, and each petitioner's objection had the objection that was filed by those objectors, particular to that congressional district, and then the names of the delegates, I believe, followed. There are multiple pages of documents. My biggest concern, I think, with your position is you seem to be arguing that if nobody in the party objects to the candidacy or the nominations, then it's really not an issue for anyone else to be involved with which seems to me to create a problem about compliance with the statutes. And you could have, under your argument, I think, complete non-compliance. I mean, if the party didn't have a precinct caucus or a county convention um, and they didn't have delegates and they didn't file any paperwork with the county auditors and then they just said they had a state convention, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, and somebody files a certificate, I think under your argument, that would be okay, right? Respectfully, Justice, I disagree. I think that what we're dealing with here is very similar to the decision that this court came to in Schmidt, where we've already addressed strict compliance with the so-called mandatory provisions of 43.24. The language in 45.15 sub two about the date of signing is mandatory. It says each signer shall add the signer's residential address, and then there's some more requirements and the date of signing. But this court in Schmidt properly focused on the legislative amendment to 43.24 sub 2a, which was we're, we have been told by the legislature that what counts is in 43.14 and 43.18. If assume the paperwork, the final paperwork, the certificate of nomination is fine on its face. Does the state have any authority to demand earlier statutory requirements be met. Uh, the timing of the caucus, the timing of the convention, the filing of the paperwork. If no person outside the party objects, why does the party have to comply at all? I think the state does have the right to enforce it and I think it can enforce it under chapter 39A. I'm just, we're saying procedurally that the method that was chosen as Chief Justice Christensen pointed out, the very aggressive lawyering here is what created this situation and has what has created this chaos. If we really care about protecting the rights of those 18 year olds in Iowa, then we're gonna make sure that objections are made properly under 39A and not slipped in at the 11th hour before an unelected panel. And that's our whole. Oh, 
Council, what's the difference between a technical problem that would be addressed under 39A and I guess a real problem that would be addressed under 43.24? see objectors today before you with an actual injury, and we're not seeing that because you're being asked for an advisory opinion. They, you know, I think Mr. Ostergren's clients would prefer, obviously, that, you, that the libertarian candidates not be on the ballot because they think that is to their electoral benefit. And so that's an, that is an injury. I mean, you may think it's an injury. I don't think it's an injury that's, in, in fact, it, 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 they view having the candidacies on the ballot as potentially an injury to, to the candidates that, that they've nominated. And, and so it is an injury. Now, I guess what I'm getting back to is your clients could have gone out, gotten the signatures, and gotten on the ballot. The state then provides sort of a second path, a fallback. In it, it, they could have provided no fallback whatsoever. So they provide a, sec a second path. You know, what, why, what's wrong with strictly enforcing that second path? I am justice because due process was violated. We didn't have notice and an opportunity to cure by going the signature route. I mean, we're talking about the old adage where the, the, the child who killed his parents asks for mercy of the court because he's an orphan. I mean, the problems that were created, we didn't have time. I mean, all of these are problems that were created by the Libertarian problem, um, Party, aren't they? were made, but we think that the problems were in fact created when the errors were discovered and then not properly informed. The Secretary of State's office was not properly informed so that we could have the kind of appropriate response to 181 minutes, which, you know, candidly, Justice Oxley, you've noted this, it's 181 minutes. What if it's one minute? What if it's three minutes? We, yeah. I mean, I can see an argument that it's not relevant. It forces the party to have a certain level of formality. It seems to me by this day, you know, this one day provision is intended to make sure that you ha that there's a separation between precinct caucuses, which are normally held in the precincts, and then county conventions, which are normally held in the counties. And that formality, that, that level of formality is the legislature saying, look, if you're not going to go out and show public support by getting signatures, at least show that, you, that the party was willing to go through enough effort and formality in order to put your name on the ballot. What's wrong with that? Two separate burdens, Justice, and that's another place that we're really seeing that substantial compliance needs to be the remedy here, because we have a burdens on the party to follow the statute when it comes to caucus and convention procedure. And then we have burdens on the candidate to certify their candidacy or to get signatures. So if we have a candidate that's relying on their party and then they bring in their certificate of nomination and that is legally insufficient in some way, then the burden then shifts back to the party to cure. you and that's and that's and, and and I understand that argument but I mean the other side of the coin is the candidate could have gone out and gotten signatures like other candidates did and then by not doing so they then are it's in some respect at the mercy of the party that and the trust in the party having followed proper procedures I, I, I mean I again I I struggle to see what's fundamentally unfair about that so what I would say, Justice, is when you have an opportunity to move forward as a major political party, as the libertarians have, certainly you have to have the rights and responsibilities. With great privilege comes great responsibility, right? So you are, in, you are supposed to follow these rules, no question. But again, we come back to the 181 minutes. Is it inappropriate? Is it improper? Is it unjust to say to a candidate, you relied on your political party and you shouldn't have. You should just go out and get your signatures on your own, be the lone wolf. The benefit of being a part of a major party in the state of Iowa is that you can rely on your party. Now here, we have some challenges with that reliance. Certainly, there were errors that were made that have been conceded. However, there was a finding that the conventions did in fact occur. The, pa the panel in fact made that finding and there's evidence in the record to support it. So at this point to place the burden then on the candidate, the candidate is the embodiment of the voters 
hopes the person they want to vote for, the person the delegate has said, this one is the one who's going to represent us. That's where I think the fundamental rights come in. Any other questions by the court? Thank you very much, Justices. It's been an honor. Uh, the case of Luda Aldrich and Bataglia is hereby submitted um, to the court. We do plan to issue an opinion before the deadline which has been established by Iowa Secretary of State. And it's our understanding um, that the deadline is 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, September 11th. Thank you. Court is adjourned.